Now we'll palpate her abdomen. Again, we're going to feel in all four quadrants. I generally like to start in the lower quadrants and work my way up. Unlike with your adult patients, it is not uncommon for us to be able to feel a spleen in a normal newborn. We don't always feel it, but it's common that we can. And particularly in a very relaxed and uh, uh, brand newborn baby, we can sometimes even feel their kidneys as well. Okay. And so as we press carefully, we don't need much pressure. And again, one or two fingers is usually quite enough to cover a lot of ground. And as we work our way up, I'm not feeling any spleen tip or the spleen. And we'll do some deeper palpation in a moment after we've come up on the right side. We're going to do the same thing, feeling for the liver and the right kidney. While she's certainly responding to my touch, I would not say that she's acting like this is tender to her. She is grimacing a little bit, but uh, I think she's just uh, not enjoying being bothered. And I'm feeling her liver edge maybe a half a centimeter below her right costal margin. And we'll percuss out that span in a moment. No other masses that I'm feeling, not tender. Again, the other thing you can often feel in these babies is a full bladder. And hers doesn't feel particularly full. She may prove us wrong in a moment, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Now we'll do a little deeper palpation to see if we can, again, find her left kidney and or the spleen. And she's being very cooperative here, letting me do this. I'm pressing up with my left hand and trying to bring my fingers together. And I'm feeling her spleen tip right here under my right middle finger. Normal consistency, normal position, and not enlarged. I'm not finding her right kidney. And we're going to do the same thing on her right side, looking for her right kidney. I'm sorry. And once again, I'm not able to find her right kidney. Which again, if we were able to palpate it, that would not be abnormal, but we can't always feel it. So on palpation of her abdomen, seems to be very normal. We're now going to try and percuss out her liver span. And so I'm locating her intercostal spaces, and we'll do some percussion. And I would say her liver span is from here to here, which I would say is about three centimeters. I don't have a ruler with me to measure. And so now we're set with her abdominal exam. So now we'll proceed down from the abdomen to the genital uh, urinary exam. And our young lady here, uh, she's just peed for us, so we're going to observe her genitalia here. And what we're going to note, first of all, is that her labia majora are the prominent structure compared to her labia minora. If she was a slightly more premature infant, her minora might be the more prominent structure, but she's a full-term baby, and so she's got appropriate anatomy here. One of the things we're going to do is carefully pull apart her labia majora and expose the vaginal introitus here, and we can see some slight amount of whitish discharge, which is a normal occurrence in a term baby or even in a premature infant from some of the estrogen stimulation they received in utero. No other abnormal structures. We're also going to palpate her labia majora for any masses, which could be hernia or could be testicles if she was a feminized male. We're also going to palpate in the inguinal area for any inguinal hernias. Now we're going to move on to the anus and rectum. We don't do rectal exams routinely in this age group, but we're going to observe the anal opening, which appears normal. We're going to look for any fissures or fistulas and any abnormal positioning. It appears to be patent. And then we're also going to tip her up a little bit further to see if she has any kind of sacral dimple or a pit here, which could communicate with the spinal canal 
and she looks nice and normal there. We're also looking for tufts of hair in case she has spina bifida occulta. And that does it for the anus and rectal exam. So we'll re-hook up her diaper here for the sake of modesty as well as comfort. And we'll proceed on to her neurologic exam. Now she's gotten a little bit unhappy with us here, so we're glad we did our heart and lungs first. With respect to her neurologic exam, first thing we're going to kind of observe, and we've been observing during her exam, is her mental state. She's been appropriately responsive to this exam. She has kind of grimaced when we've poked and prodded her. Um, she's gotten a little uncomfortable during some parts of the exam, so she's exhibited a normal cry. Um, she's shown uh, some normal looking tone by her posture, but now we're actually going to put her limbs through a range of motion to kind of assess her muscular tone, which in upper extremities is both symmetric and normal to me. And then we will try to assess her tone in her lower extremities by flexing and extending her hips and knees. And that also seems to be quite normal and symmetric. Now for a cranial nerve exam in this age group, we're not typically going to put them through maneuvers because they obviously can't cooperate, but we've noticed during her exam that she has cried normally, uh, so she's demonstrated some vocalization. She has blinked and opened her eyes and looked around, so she's demonstrated pretty intactness of her uh, extraocular muscles. Um, uh, she's had some nice symmetry with her cry that her mouth is uh, uh, going up symmetrically in both corners, so her facial muscle uh, strength is normal and symmetric. So that's about the best we can do with her general uh, cranial nerve exam. Deep tendon reflexes, again, if their tone has been normal and not showing any focal deficits, we typically kind of uh, uh, begin and end with just a patellar stretch reflex, for which in this age group, we rarely need an actual uh, reflex hammer. Usually your finger just hitting right on the patellar tendon is enough to get your normal stretch and normal knee jerk. And hers is pretty normal. I would say uh, two plus out of four on both sides and very symmetric. The other thing that we can see in some babies, not all, is with a little stretch on the ankle, we might get a few beats of clonus up to seven or eight would be normal. She doesn't have any on the right, and we'll try it on the left. And no clonus for her on either, either ankle. Her Babinskis, sometimes infant toes will up, be upgoing in response to a scratch, and hers are a little bit upgoing on the right. And pretty neutral on the left, maybe a little bit upgoing on the left as well, which would not be abnormal up to the age of about one. We're also going to check her for some automatisms, and that's going to be a normal grasp reflex. When we put our finger in her palm, she'll grasp. They will typically also grasp a little bit, uh, plantar grasp with their feet, but she's kind of bandaged up here. But if we kind of stroke the bottom of her feet, she's going to tend to try to grasp that, which she does pretty well on both sides. If we kind of tickle her mouth, we expect her to root towards that side. Now, she's a little on the sleepy side, so she may not do that as extensively as... She might if she was a little hungrier at the moment, so she's not rooting real well. And we can also demonstrate her suck by either a pacifier or watching her feed in general is our best way of doing that. So she's not going to root for us. I don't think she's acting too hungry at the moment. So very good. And then one last automatism. We're going to demonstrate a moral reflex. And for this, we tip her up a few inches off of the warmer or off of the bassinet if you were examining her there. And we're going to quickly kind of let her uh, drop back to the bed with some care here. And we're going to look for the extension and then flexion of her arms and legs in a symmetric fashion in a startle. And so we'll do that in one, two, three. And she extended out and then flexed back in. She didn't do much with her legs, but she's moved those around comfortably before. And so I'd say she has a nice, normal, symmetric moral. So that would be the extent of your screening neurologic exam in a baby of this age. And now we'll move on to the musculoskeletal exam. Once again, we're initially going to start this with observation. We're going to look at her limbs for symmetry and length. 
and for any obvious deformities of which we see none. We're going to look carefully at our digits to see if they are normally positioned to make sure there's no syndactyly or polydactyly. And her fingers are looking normal. Her nail beds also look nice and normal on both hands. And again, she wants to grasp what we put in there. We're also going to look at her toes again for syndactyly, polydactyly, any deformities, and any other problems of which she has none. Everything looks very nice and normal, normally positioned, normal lengths, no problems there. We're also going to want to look carefully at her spine. We've looked at the lower part previously. But we want to look again for any tufts of hair that might uh, indicate uh, spina bifida occulta. And for any obvious scoliosis, she looks nice and straight. So certainly nothing of any clinical significance going on there. And again, no obvious spinal abnormalities as well. We're going to take another good peek at her feet, which again often have significant uh, curvatures and rotational deformities related to being folded up in the uterus for such a long period of time. But her feet are actually pretty nice and straight. There's no metatarsus varus where they're kind of uh, uh, turned inward on their axis. There's no club foot here, so we're just checking that to be careful. 